Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me for this Life Over Coffee podcast. I am Rick Thomas. I am very glad that you are here. If you happen to be listening to this episode as a podcast, if you don't mind, if you would subscribe to that podcast platform, if it's iTunes, Podbean, Google Play, SoundCloud, uh, Spotify, wherever you may be listening, Stitcher, tuned in, on and on. Uh, If you would subscribe and then also give us a nice rating that would be fantastic even write a review that would be wonderful it would be one way that you could serve us what does that do well it helps us to reach more people and so the more people that are talking about what we are doing well that is better as long as we're saying good things of course and then if you're watching uh, this episode on our youtube channel or our rumble channel if you don't mind if you would uh, subscribe to those channels and then also uh, share it with a friend, uh, your pastor, your small group leader, uh, your counselor, if you're in counseling, uh, family and friends, share our resources broadly and widely. It is one of the best ways that you could support this ministry. This is episode 413, and the title of it is The Problem with Wounded Theology and Victim Identity. These are things that you have heard of. Well, I want to talk about it in this episode. Again, thank you so much for being here. Episode 413, The Problem with Wounded Theology and Victim Identity. Now, perhaps you have heard someone talk about father wounds or daddy issues. Typically, these descriptors fit within a wounded theology construct. What do I mean by that? Well, a construct is like a a bucket, a, a big basket that you put things in. And so I've labeled this basket, this construct, a wounded theology construct, and you'll find all kinds of ideas and concepts, words, labels, descriptors fit inside of this construct. And father wounds and daddy issues are definitely two labels that would fit within this construct. Now, a wounded theology construct, it it is part of a materialistic anthropological worldview that veers from the teaching of Scripture. What is an anthropological worldview? Anthropology is the doctrine of mankind, the doctrine of humanity. Anthropos logos is the study of humanity. A materialistic anthropological worldview, well, It is a Darwinian worldview is what it is, that we are material beings, that we are not spiritual beings, a biological, scientific worldview. And when we talk about a wounded theology, well, you can can hear it in the language of being wounded. That is something that we would say about our bodies. And so what, what is happening here is that when you integrate the culture into our Christian perspectives, we always come away with some kind of of hybrid that is neither Christian nor secular. And so the question is, what are the complicated problems with wounded theology and a victim identity mindset? Now again, what I don't want to do is to minimize anything that has happened to you. I'm not doing that at all. But if you want help, for what has happened to you, then the Bible is sufficient in helping you for what has happened to you. And so as I reframe the conversation and reframe the argument, it has nothing to do with taking away or minimizing or saying what happened to you did not happen. And so I'm not saying that at all. I mean, there is no question that fathers are vital in every child's life. I mean, you can look at virtually any statistic. For example, if you look at the rising stats about crime just in America, predominantly uh, these major crimes that are happening are from people who did not have dads during their childhoods. That is a common statistic that you will see with violent crime. Without compelling and nurturing authority figures, particularly fathers in our lives, 
There are many temptations to find replacements to satiate these longings in our souls. And so we come into this world with a communal longing. A father figure is a representative of, of sorts of God the Father. I have done entire webinars on this. I have taught this in, in seminars around the country. I have written articles. You can type the word father in our search feature and you will find where I talk about the importance of fathers. And so again, I'm not minimizing the importance of these things. And if we have been damaged, for example, by our fathers, as I have. I'm not minimizing that at all. The problem arises, though, when we cast the very real narratives in our lives as something that has happened to us as though they are wounds, that materialistic, anthropological worldview, that biological model that I was talking about earlier. The language of victimization will begin to shape how we think about what happened to us. You see, when you start talking about a materialistic worldview and when you use these catchy labels like father wounds or wounded theology or a victim identity, what we're doing here is that we, we're now thinking in a horizontal way. Uh, we're thinking an under-the-sun way. Horizontal thinking misses the grander purposes of suffering from a God-centered presupposition. You will rarely hear wounded victims talk about what God meant for good. You see, two things can be true at the same time. The chief reference here, of course, is Genesis 50, 20. Joseph didn't talk about being wounded by his brothers. He didn't have a primary horizontal sight line when he looked at the complexity and when he comprehended the totality of his problems. He acknowledged what they did. You meant it for evil. But he saw the spiritual aspect of that, not a biological, wounded, materialistic, anthropological model. And so two things can be true at the same time, but one of those things will have more power, more persuasion over you, and that will set the trajectory for how you work through or if you work through your problems. And so the two things that are true is you have hurt me, you have sinned against me. That's what happened on the horizontal plane. But he saw things through the lens of God-centeredness and that is the best way to frame the things that have happened to us, which again does not minimize what happened to us, but it does change the sight line for how we see the issues and also the kind of help that we are going to find. And so rather than being problem-centered, what you did, you meant for evil, what someone did to me. It is better to be God-centered. And now you're asking another question. What is God doing through me because of this or despite this? When you center your problems on the Lord, you look to Him for answers and a path forward. When you center your problems on yourself... You look inward for human-centered, possibly selfishly motivated or self-protective answers because without a God-centered worldview, all you have is yourself. Therefore, you can only rely on yourself. And so the focus becomes your hurt, what they did. And that is a setup for a victim culture. Paul was talking in 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 through 6, about how to fight the problems in our world. And he said in that passage of Scripture that though we walk in the flesh, meaning we live in fleshly mortal bodies, though we live in these fleshly bodies, we are not waging war according to the flesh. We should not fight like humans. Though we are humans, we should not fight like humans, for the weapons of our warfare are not of flesh, but have divine power that destroy 
strongholds. And then he goes on and talks about how to destroy those strongholds, those thought arguments, those lofty opinions that are raised against the knowledge of God and how to take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience. And so as we, even though we live in the flesh, walk according to the flesh, in human bodies, we don't want to fight like humans. But if our worldview is materialistic, if we embrace a biological model, if that is our doctrine of anthropology, then our sight lines will be horizontal and we can only focus on what happened to us and we will use a nomenclature that communicates that like wounded theology or daddy issues or father wounds. Wounded theology is also part of the self-esteem mindset worldview. It's a self-esteem is a societal theology that amps up the focus on self. And so imagine yourself being enculturated in self-esteem ideology for multiple generations as I have. Well, that too, and then you bring in a this materialistic worldview to talk about your problems. Well, when problem solving, you never want to start with yourself by placing the accent mark on yourself. But the self-esteem culture now gloms on to this worldview, which makes it even more difficult to extract yourself from the problem and to think about what is happening from a God-centered perspective. What you want to do, what I want to do, is I want to begin with God. Let me explain or let me share a few illustrations of what the someone wounded me mindset communicates. For example, I'll use me as an illustration. My daddy was a mean person and so I will find a replacement by trusting nobody but myself. You see how the horizontal wounded theology is working here. It's not about what God is doing in me. It's not about God's perspective, God's plans, the greater good that could be going on, how God could use sin sinlessly. No, I'm thinking completely horizontally and I have been wounded by my father and therefore I'm going to go into self-reliant motivations and so I will not trust anybody else at all. I am divorced and lonely. And so I will find another spouse because I deserve it. Rather than thinking through what God might have in mind through this horrific relational tragedy that has happened to you, again, a self-reliant response to it, and I'm just going to go do what I want to. Again, we're living under the sun, a very sublunary way of thinking and responding to the difficulties in our lives. Here's a third illustration. My parents were unkind people. And so it's okay that I live the way that I want. A, a completely, I have been wounded, I have been hurt in this horrific way, and so I'm going to pendulum swing into the other ditch, and I'm just going to live any way that I want to. Again, a very under-the-sun way of thinking, but that is a wounded theology, a victim identity mindset. That is a Darwinian materialistic way of responding to the bad things that happen to us. What are these folks doing? They are satiating a longing in their souls for God because ultimately that is what's going on. The satisfaction that we're going to have will only come from God alone. But they're trying to satiate this longing for God through self-centered reactionary means. Some of these longings for a communal experience with the divine there is a discontentment here, there is a hopelessness, a loneliness, a fear, and they're trying to satiate these things that only God can satiate, and they're doing it through human-centered means. And so how do you help them? That is the big question. How do you help a person that's given over to a wounded theology, victim identity mindset? Well, this will create a huge tension. And the tension is with the solution. You see, there are two things that are happening to them. I call this the victim center construct. And so now we have another construct, another bucket. And in that bucket are two things that are amalgam. Uh, 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 amalgam 
uh, amalgamated, assimilated is what I'm trying to say. My mind is mentally working fast as I'm working through this podcast and sometimes I get tied up on words. But the two things in this bucket, in this construct, is the victim center construct and they are assimilated. The abused will only accept one aspect of that and that is their victimness. What they will not accept is their fallenness. And I mentioned some of those fallen concepts earlier. Discontentment, hopelessness, loneliness, fear. Those are things that are common to all of us, but what happens when you are hurt by someone, those normal things that come with our fallen Adamic package are amped up and intensified. They have always existed. We are born discontented and hopeless and lonely and fearful and struggling with shame and guilt. And the list goes on and on. That is part of the fallenness. And that is very real, whether you have ever been victimized or not. And so the person who has been abused will only accept part of that construct. I have been victimized, and unfortunately, it truncates, it circumvents their ability to find help because there is a broader complexity to what's going on here. It's the victim center construct, the victim fallenness, the victim Adamic construct, if you will. They will say, I am a victim, someone has hurt me, and that will be the center and the warp and the woof of how they think about what is going on in their lives. I have been victimized, that's it. But also, I am a sinner. Now when I say that, I'm not saying that you cause the victimization. You have to dichotomize this. I'm not saying that because you are a sinner that you cause that, and that's what some people will do. They will conflate that because they will hear that I am a sinner. Oh, you're saying that it's my fault. No, I never actually said that at all. I did not say that at all. Replay the tape. I did not say that at all. I said that we're all fallen people. Whether you're victimized or not, we are fallen people. And so we can honestly say, I am a victim and I am a sinner. What does it mean to, 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 to say that I am a damn it, whether I'm, whether, I, whether I'm victimized or not? It says I have deeper longings just like everyone else. Perhaps what happened to me compounded those things like loneliness and discontentment and hopelessness and fear and shame and and guilt. Maybe what happened to me intensified those things, but those things were already there, even though they may be compounded now. And I must deal with what it means to be Adamic. This is where a biological, materialistic, anthropological worldview will not help you because it completely dismisses the fact of our fallenness and the spiritual needs in our lives, our relationship with the divine. And so this issue is a challenge for even the skilled counselor because the thought of factoring in fallenness in light of the abuse leads to potential adverse reactions. And some of you know that quite well. I touched on how to care for a person like this in my article, which is also a webinar too. It's a one-hour webinar when I talked about empathy and sympathy. And I'm not going to repeat that here, uh, but you can watch that one-hour webinar. You can uh, read that article on empathy and sympathy, and it will really help you to understand the problem that we cause. We actually compound the problem of the victim when we don't approach them the right way with a fuller understanding of what's going on in their lives. Many counselors do not have the skill to walk the abused through these tensions or they lack the courage to discuss these matters with them. And so they would not touch the fallenness aspect with a 10-foot pole. And of course, what is the result? If we don't bring full soul care to these individuals? Well, in his book, San Francisco, uh, Michael Schellenberger nails the worst case scenario of the damaged soul blinded by their inherent fallenness. When you think about that language again, truly, authentically, genuinely damaged soul, they have been hurt 
but because they don't have a fuller understanding of the complexity of what's going on inside of them, they are blinded by their inherent fallenness. Here is the quote from Michael Schellenberger's book, San Francisco, quote, The dark side of victimology is how it moralizes power. Victimology takes the truth that it is wrong for people to be victimized and distorts it by going a step further. Victimology asserts that victims are inherently good because they have been victimized. You see, uh, in that quote, he's saying that victimology says that we're inherently good, not recognizing that we're fallen people. Schellenberger goes on to say it robs victims of their moral agency and creates double standards that frustrates any attempt to criticize their behavior, even if they are behaving in self-destructive, antisocial ways. Such reasoning is obviously faulty. It purifies victims of all badness, and it insists that pure victim goodness can only result in more good things, never bad ones. Such a view is obviously wrong, but by appealing to emotion, victimology overrides reason and logic. That is a fantastic quote, and I would love for you to get it. You can copy and paste it. It's here in the show notes of episode 413, titled The Problem with Wounded Theology and Victim Identity. And so the, the problem here is then it becomes our identity. If we don't deal with the full complexity of what is going on in an individual's life, and they only land on and place the accent mark on what happened to them, then their story is going to create a narrative and it's going to be the story of the victim's abuse. And that's what you will hear from them most all the time. They will talk about their story. You will not hear as much about how great God is doing or how uh, how great how, how great God is doing something special, how God is doing something special despite what happened to them. After a while, the continual replaying of the abuse narrative provides them an identity. And so now we have gone from father wounds, what happened to me, horizontal sight lines, that becomes the only narrative in their life, what that person did to me. It sanitizes all of my behavior, all of my reactions. I can do whatever I want, as I was illustrating earlier with those self-reliant reactions to being wounded by someone, being hurt by someone. And so they will only think about what happened to them. They will miss this grander complex, this grander notion of what God is doing in their life despite of what happened. And then by the continual replaying of the abuse narrative, they will have a victim identity. They become survivors. That is how they will talk about themselves. And that is bandied about. They will bandy about this identity of being a survivor more than you will hear them talk about being a Christian. And when you listen to victims, you you want to gauge where they are by the content of what they say. They either frame things in a God-centered worldview, which has been my appeal throughout this episode, or they're going to frame things through a personal identity worldview, uh, which is a victim identity because of their daddy wounds, for example, as, as, an, as one of the potential abusers. Whatever you make your identity will determine your attitude, it'll determine your behavior, it'll determine what you will tolerate from other people, It will determine what you will do to them if they go against your identity worldview. If you press my identity worldview and say that I am no longer a Christian, I cannot be a Christian, I must deny Christ, well, there will be an adverse reaction from me. Well, in the uh, victim identity world, if you press what happened to them in the wrong way, then they will sanitize their reaction to you and they can respond in some most ungodly ways because that is their primary identity. Which brings us to what is the solution. When the focus becomes someone wounded Christ, then you're at a different place. You're thinking about better questions. You're thinking about transformative applications. For example, let me give you three illustrations. 
I am focusing more on what has happened to me or what has happened to Christ because of me. That is a big question that we have to answer. And where you land on that question, it will set the trajectory for how you progress through whatever has happened to you. Am I focused more on what has happened to me or more on what has happened to Christ? Now, caveat here, I am not, again, minimizing what happened to, happening, happened to you, but I am prioritizing it. What happened to Christ is more important than what happened to us, and he has to be our primary focus. Number two, am I more controlled by what others did to me or what the Father is doing in me? and through me because of the wounds of Christ. That's a different kind of wound that you're focusing on now. And so what is controlling me more? What other people have done to me or what Christ is doing in me and through me because of the wounds of Christ? Number three, are my circumstances shaping me into the image of the Savior? And ultimately, that is, that is the result of being wounded or other people sinning against you. If my circumstances are not shaping me into the image of Christ, then I'm missing the point of my circumstances. Wounded theology is the wrong path to go down. It will harden anyone into victimization while missing the purposes of the crushing of Christ and the eventual freedom we experience so we could be free. My argument here and my warning against wounded theology are not about denying the horrific events in anyone's life, but about reframing the solution in a Christocentric, cross-carrying worldview that leads to a God-centered victory. Again, this is episode 413, The Problem with Wounded Theology and a Victim Identity. I want to wrap up by asking you a few questions in the call to action. And again, you can get all this information that I'm sharing with you in this episode 413. Number one, do you consider yourself a victim of something or someone? What happened? Who, who did what to you? This is something that you really want to talk about, that you want to talk with someone. Again, we're not denying what has happened, and it's something that you want to articulate, and it's something that you want to do in community with at least one other competent person, a person who is competent in Scripture that you can talk to, that you can trust, that you can share your heart with them of what happened to you. Do you consider yourself a victim of something or someone? What happened? Who did what to you? Number two. When you think of how Joseph framed his ordeal, what happened to him, what they did to him, he talked about the horizontal sin and the vertical purposes. He placed the accent mark on God's purposes, not his sinister brothers. What do you think about that? How does it apply to you? Now, that would be something that you want to follow up to talk with your competent and courageous friend. And so you're not denying what happened to you. You want to talk about it. You want to understand it. You don't want to minimize it at all. But now you want to think about how to frame it. And you either frame it as horizontal sin controlling you or the vertical purposes of God that are controlling you. Number three, are you blind to your behaviors? Do you take an unwitting license to sin against others? albeit you're not in tune with what you're doing, maybe. Think about that Schellenberger quote that I read earlier, where we can moralize our behavior because uh, of what happened to us, where we elevate ourselves onto a self-righteous perch, and we take this superiority position because we have been victimized. Perhaps one of the ways that you can examine this, again, the question is, do you take an unwitting license to sin against others, what if you scrolled through your social media history to review how you talk to other people? Maybe that would be a good way to examine uh, your perspective and how you're processing through what has happened to you. Number four, do you carry unforgiveness in your heart toward someone? Though you might not be able to transact forgiveness, what do you need to do to at least have an attitude of forgiveness toward someone? And then finally, number five, what specific way do you need to change to be more God-centered 
This is episode 413. The title of it is The Problem with Wounded Theology and Victim Identity. Thank you so much for listening to the podcast.